Thank you all. Thank you all for joining us. Amy, we've just had a really interesting glimpse into what can be. Yeah. We're going to have a chance to talk about what should be. Um, but first, I want to begin with some context. So sure. you've been working in robotics now for coming up on 15 years. You, when you were first a part of a team uh, training surgeons to perform uh, remotely with robotics. What do you recall about the attitudes about robotics then yeah. versus where we are now? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So even though 15 years might not feel like such a long time in, in the tech world, so much has, has actually really changed. So when I was a part of this team, I wasn't studying robot ethics. I was a cell biologist or you know, doing my studies in cell biology, and I was working as part of a technical team, training the surgeons, testing their performance. And I was struck by how the way that we were measuring the success of the robot was in this very quantitative you know, analysis, the systematic approach, but there were so many other things happening that we weren't taking into consideration. How did the surgeon feel while they were performing the surgery? How did the rest of the staff in the surgical suite feel? You know, how was the whole practice of, of surgery evolving? And there wasn't anyone asking those questions or, or even trying to answer those questions. So I was kind of that person saying, hey, what's, you know, what, what's going on? And then I, I went and I started to study ethics, and this was uh, 2004, 2006, when really the field of robot ethics was just starting to take shape. So at that time, 2004, 2006, it was you know sporadic here and there, some people asking questions, what might the impact of this technology be? But now we can see that's really a lot more attention that's being paid to this. We have people who study robot ethics. We have foundations like Responsible Robotics. We have universities like MIT starting colleges dedicated to artificial intelligence that will also address robotics issues. So there now is the time where you know there's something in the air, people are concerned with what's happening, and and also just wanting to, to innovate in a different way and in a responsible way. Thank you. So, I mean, it's only natural, right? We're humans, and the more yeah. kind of the primacy of being human is threatened or brought into question, the more we care about yeah. the ethical concerns and the broader societal concerns. And, you know, as you've kind of brought us up to where we are now, it's tempting to want to jump 15 years into the future and talk about where we'll be then, but I think the immediate future is interesting enough, right. and we just saw evidence of that on this right. stage. So as technology evolves soon, we assume, to the point where robots are able to respond to and care for us and our families, or to serve as functional substitutes for professional colleagues, when do we cross that line from thinking of robotics and AI as technological support to companions? Yeah. So that's a, that's a really important question, this idea of robots as companions, and also something that you said before, when will robots be caring for us? And we have to really think carefully about the language that we use. Is a robot ever going to care for us, to care about us, that kind of thing? Or is it just going to be included in our care system? It will be another tool that we use. So, but getting back to this idea of when does it shift from the instrumental to the companion, we have to think about why we made robots in the first place and why we are making robots. And that's to make systems and processes more efficient, right? We need things to happen faster. We need things to happen in a more organized manner. If we're talking about large warehouses where you have millions of products and you need to get them out for delivery, those are the reasons that are inspiring the robotics movement right now. And the reason why we want these technologies is to free up our time so that we as humans can do the things you know, that are meaningful. We can establish relationships. We can be there for our children, for our parents, for the people on this planet that need us. So if we then switch and we start to make robots to do these other things, these meaningful things, these things that are part of the good life, which is ethics, right, which is sort of what I am concerned with, then Really, what are we going to do? What's that other thing that we're supposed to be doing? So why, why are we making them to fulfill these roles in the first place? That would be the first thing that I sort of, you know, put on the table to have us reflect on. Do we want to see this shift actually taking place? And then, you know, if we separate the questions, can we do it versus should we do it? Mm -hmm. The first thing that I was talking about is really about should we be doing it? And, and how did we get there in our thinking? But the other question about can, yes, of course, you know, we just saw a presentation that w we can do it and we can use these technologies to fulfill some of these roles. But it's so important that at the same time that we're asking the can, we couple it with the should and also how should. 
So we might see that some of these use cases are great, right? And so yes, let's have robots that have social capabilities and that can fulfill roles that take on a more friendship or companionship tone, but how should we do that? And we might then have to be, say that, well, we have to be really careful about who we make these robots for. So do we want elderly people to have robot companions and not human companions? Do we want children to have robot companions and not human companions. So a long answer to the question of, yeah, we, you know, it's quite possible that we will see this transition into the more companionship. Should we do it and how? So let's talk about should for, for a little yeah. bit. And, and you brought up one interesting use case, which is um, robot support, if we're gonna avoid, the, avoid yeah. the word companion for the moment, for the elderly, perhaps also for the disabled. If you think about, if you think about a use case, and I hate to, talk about humans as a use case, but yeah. you think about a use case where someone has mobility issues, um, they have infrequent human contact for whatever reason. Can a robot serve as some sort of, some sort of human proxy, at least for some emotional needs? Right, so there's an interesting company in Denmark called No Isolation, and they make robots that act as surrogates. So for children who are too ill to leave the home or for individuals who are too sick to, to be able to leave the home, they can uh, telecommunicate with their friends and family, but the robot goes out into the real world for them. So they are still getting to experience what school is like, or they still get to go out and do things, but in, in the comfort of their own home. So you can see how you can use the technology to enable you to still function and participate in the world, but not to replace the human-human contact that is really you know, quite essential for, for our own development as individuals, but also for how we treat other people in the world. If, if we start to replace our human-human interactions with human-robot, what is that gonna mean then as we go through I interacting with other humans on any level, professional or personal? So on that note, um, let's talk for a minute about robots at sex surrogates, which is an area rich in innovation, whether we like it or not. Yeah. Um, and that is certainly a form of human-to-human -human interaction. It is, yes it is. So the, the sex robot debate is, is really quite interesting. First, I think what makes it so fascinating is because it's a fantastic example just to look at all of the issues that are facing robotics in general. And then it provides this very attractive platform to discuss them because of course sex sells. But if you're looking at, you know, sort of broad strokes, the positives and the negatives, or the potential positives, potential negatives, right now we hear a lot about the way that sex robots look, that oftentimes it's the female body in a pornographic, exploitative manner. And of course, that's, that's not the way that we want the technology to move forward. But the way that it is now doesn't necessarily have to be the way that it moves forward. We are at a perfect moment right now to begin to do some research into different kinds or different demographics or stakeholders that might be interested in the technology and how we could shape the future development so that it meets different preferences, different sort of looks, different sort of images. So one issue is, is how the robots look right now as being detrimental, but I think we have the opportunity to change that. Also looking at different groups that might be interested uh, persons with disabilities or elderly persons who don't have access to the technology, perhaps this could be a way to provide them with some kind of support in terms of sexual gratification. Um, again, we need to do the studies to learn whether or not they would even be interested in this kind of thing. Uh, and then, of course, you have uh, some negative aspects, not just the way the robot looks, but also will it create social isolation? Will people not want to interact you know, with, with other human beings? Uh, what is the relationship between a human and a robot. It's certainly not this reciprocal, relational, compassionate, empathetic interaction. So what is it and are we doing a, a disservice to human beings in general by having this technology available? So I'm, I'm not uh, saying that we should ban the technology. I'm saying that we should actually start to do some research to find out what is the best way to move forward with this technology. How do we make it available to those who could really benefit from it? So we, we've been talking mostly to this point about some, some really interesting ethical issues at the human-to-human -human level, but there are also some rather significant broader societal issues that we're wrestling with, job loss being, being yep. one that is very important, and the potential for widespread replacement of human beings by ever-increasingly intelligent technologies. And as we, think about, as we think about the issue with robotics, both human-to-human, and way up here on kind of broad societal implications, the question is, 
who should play, who steps in, right? Yeah. Is there a role for a governing body? Is there regulation that we need? And how does that then relate to discussions around ethics and values? Right, no, that's a great question. I would also add to your list, you know, when you have the human-human interactions and then the sort of job loss, I would add to that list. We're also talking about sustainable development issues. We're talking about environmental implications of the technology. These are plastics that we're using. Uh, what materials are going to be used to create the, robo the robot? How will it be taken out of its uh, life cycle? What's the degradation process? Will it be recyclable? On and on, right? So we have the, a lot of research and development questions to address. There is a role for regulation. We have right now in Europe the GDPR, which is a protection of our data security and our data rights. So we have some areas that are already covered, but we, uh, and you know, ethics is, is usually the foundation for regulation. Ethics is, is the, the branch of research that studies the good life, and regulation is meant to support the good life. It's meant to provide the necessary conditions for a good society that individuals can live freely within. But at a certain moment, uh, regulation gets you so far, and that's when we also need the not-for-profit organizations and we need in industry to step up and to take us a, a step further. And that's one of the things that actually uh, I'm trying to do with my team at the Foundation for Responsible Robotics, working together with Deloitte. We're trying to create a quality mark, a quality mark for robot products. So in the same way that when you buy a fair trade product, you know that this product has had to go through rigorous standards and accreditation before it can get that logo. Um, or Fairphone, for example, changing the whole development process of a smartphone. And we think it's time that we do that for robotics. We think it's time that we have a system in place where companies are then accountable, can make uh, innovative progress when it comes to sustainability, environmental awareness, environmental use of, of products and whatnot, and that they can be rewarded for this. And consumers then also are in a position where they get to choose which products they buy. They get to decide, I want to buy the robot that actually conforms with my social values. So that's really interesting. Um, and I can think of some cases where um, marks or indices have been embraced only by the best performers, right? Patagonia has built a brand around its transparency, around its sustainability. How do you, how do you think about something like this? And I know you're, you're in the relatively yeah. early stages in a way that will encourage kind of inclusion. Yeah, yeah. So in order to encourage inclusion, that means that we can't design in a vacuum, right? We can't be thinking about what is this quality mark going to cover with just you know, an ethicist at the table. We need companies at the table. We need people who specialize in auditing at the table. So Deloitte has partnered with us um, and volunteered their, their time, their hours to, to show what does the accreditation or the auditing process look like. But we also need robot companies to help out. We need to bring robot companies to the table so that they can say, this is how our systems work. And especially for the small startup companies, you know, we're learning that there isn't a large choice when it comes to materials, you know, that you have a procurement officer who sort of says, well, these are the materials that you have available, especially if you're in an incubator, and you don't get to sort of pick and choose. And so that's the kind of information that we need to know so that we can try and put pressure to change that practice, so that we can try and create an alternative where you can buy materials that are sourced in, in a different manner. So we really need the robotics companies, the small, the medium, the large, to come to the table to help us shape this quality mark. And so if you're a tech entrepreneur in the audience, yeah. if you're an AI, if you're launching an AI startup and you're in this audience, the ship hasn't sailed is what you're saying. Yeah, in other yeah, words, really. there's still time to yeah, get involved Yeah, we're still at the early stages and we're still working out um, and selecting, we'll have two different phases of pilot companies, one phase of pilot companies that is really at the table with us, uh, working to develop and create, and another set of pilot companies that are volunteering to actually go through the process for the first time. So in the same way that you go through FDA approval, and now they're working on a pre-certification, we will do the same thing. So companies will go through a sort of certification process and or a pre-certification process. So what does the timeline look, at, look like for, for launching this? Yeah, so by the end of uh, this academic year, so I guess uh, May, June 2019, we'd like to have our prototype ready. So this is what the framework looks like. This is what the process actually looks like. And then after that, then we go through a series of pilot testing on different companies. Because we also understand that, you know, once we have a prototype, it's not done at that moment, right? There's still going to be tweaking. We still have to understand how the landscape is changing. The idea, too, is that we don't want to be antagonistic with the robotics industry. We want to do this in a way that allows ethics to accompany design. We want to do this in a way that 
you know, allows ethics to inspire design. So instead of having, well, you know, this is going to stifle innovation, we want the starting point to be, all right, let's, let's innovate in a way that takes the social good or values like environmental sustainability, accountability uh, at the center, and then we go from there and we design. So do you imagine that the adoption of yeah. a product, Mark, is going to be kind of bottom up? maybe market driven or are you will you be reaching out to kind of larger governmental bodies in support of this yeah i think we'll have a two-pronged approach i think it's really important um because it's all you know it's very much a grassroots initiative we have a not-for-profit organization we are volunteers leading this effort you know we are of course looking for donors and and we are doing our fundraising but we are volunteering, very much volunteering our time to do this. So we need the smaller companies um, to get on board. And we, we have a lot of work to do in terms of our own branding to make sure that the public trusts us. So we are trying to encourage trust in these companies, but that also means that we have work to do to make sure that they can trust us. So we will have branding so that it becomes a bottom-up approach. But at the same time, we are very much aware that, especially in Europe, the climate is how do we change the existing culture of maybe a lack of awareness, but sort of a lack of support of, of doing things in a different way. So we would like to have um, yeah, government support as well. In, in light of something like GDPR, would you imagine that, would you be seeking companies who already have products on the market kind of retroactively yeah. kind of adhere to, to new standards? I think it's both. Yeah. I think it would have to do both. Of course, I mean, ideally, we are looking at the companies who are sort of purpose-driven, you know, like a company like Fairphone, they had a purpose, or Tony Chocola had a purpose. Remove slavery when it comes to the production of Chocola. Fair trade, remove slavery when it comes to the production of coffee and tea. So, of course, those companies are you know, the, the champions in, in robotics. But we're also interested in, in the other companies who are more product driven, but who still want to do good. And this is a way for them to incorporate some of the, the, these processes into their uh, own research and development cycles. Are you concerned at all about giving the, peer, uh, of giving the appearance of having too much influence? Uh, see, that, that would, okay, wow, that would be an interesting problem to have. I, I've never thought of a small not-for-profit organization as having too much influence. Um, I guess that, that's a really good question, but that's why we've also established an advisory board. So we have our own steering committee that does, uh, you know, makes final decisions, but we have an advisory board that keeps us in check. So we have people uh, from outside organizations who are making sure that we are making the right decisions as we go. But again, that's why it's so important that we get robotic companies to, to come on board and to be a part of this process to help shape us and to make sure that we are also in check. We don't have to worry about having too much influence. Right. Um, we have about a minute left, and I want to kind of quickly do one thing that leaves you concerned and one thing that makes you really excited about the future. Okay. Um, yeah, I would say something that makes me concerned is, is probably, you know, we, we hear talk about um, how do we include ethics, how do we do something about ethics, and we see sort of piecemeal uh, initiatives. One company doing this thing, one company doing that thing, another company doing something else. You have DeepMind is doing a wonderful job with their ethics and society group. Uh, Google has started ethics advisory boards. So these companies have done something, but we need a joint we need a collaborative effort. Now is the time where the little bits and pieces here and there aren't gonna cut it. It's too big, it's too overarching, and those companies hold all of the power. So we need the smaller voices represented, and that's a little bit, you know, my worry is that it's dominated a little bit by, um, by these large companies who hold the power. What I'm most excited about, though, is, I mean, what scares me and what excites me is the same thing wrapped into one, is that there is so much interest in ethics. So the, the first question that you asked me, what was it like back in 2004, I was the only one at this robotics lab who was saying, hmm, but how does the surgeon feel about the surgery? What is the patient thinking about the surgery? And then I went off to study ethics. But now it's become a situation where companies have ethics advisors working in the company, or you have an ethics advisory board at, at a company, or we're working with an incubator right now that wants to have us working directly with all the, the small startup companies. So it's really exciting that maybe we don't know which direction we're going to go, but there is still a commitment to doing this in a responsible way, doing this so that companies can be accountable for the products that they make. Great. Amy, on that note, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.